vielen Dank für die einleitenden Worte. Ich freue mich natürlich außerordentlich über Ihr zahlreiches Erscheinen und Ihr Interesse an meiner Arbeit. Ich hoffe, Ihnen in dieser Antrittsvorlesung etwas genauer erklären zu können, womit wir uns beschäftigen. Teil der Vorbereitung ist auch die Frage nach der Sprache der Antrittsvorlesung. Man hat mehrere Bitten an mich gestellt, dass ich den Vortrag auf Englisch halte. Und ich habe mich dann dazu entschieden, dem Bitten nachzukommen und werde jetzt auch in die englische Sprache wechseln. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my inaugural lecture, I would like to tell you about our activities in uh, interactive simulation in medicine. Uh, the talk will be roughly 45 minutes uh, in two sections. First, I will tell you, uh, give you an overview of uh, why this uh, is interesting and important and how such a simulator uh, is, is composed, what are the ingredients, tell you a little bit about our uh, previous work, and then in the second half, um, I will tell you about some current research that we're also carrying out here in Innsbruck. And let me start with uh, some uh, data. Uh, okay, one thing I wanted to mention is the subtitle here from blood and guts to bits and bytes. I hope uh, I will can tell you about this in, in this talk and I will reveal in the end where it actually comes from. But before I come to that, um, there are some uh, numbers I want to show you which are from a study from the year 2000. And uh, in this study it was uh, found that there are 44,000 deaths per year. And this number at that time was higher than the fatalities due to highway accidents. And the additional costs due to that were 17 to 29 billion US dollars. And now you may be wondering what are these numbers? Well, uh, this was reported in a study by uh, Kuhn et al. at the uh, US Institute of Medicine in a study called To Air is Human, Building a Safer Health System. And these were the, estimate, the uh, estimated fatalities in hospitals due to error in the previous years before the study was published. Um, a few remarks on this. This is uh, uh, all causes, so it's due to ill medication, maybe mix up of, of patients, infections, uh, but also, uh, also maybe uh, adverse effects during surgical interventions. There were a number of follow-up studies in other Western countries, in Europe, in Australia, which also showed similar trends. Uh, so you can maybe imagine that there was uh, increasing discussion about this and uh, um, concerns about patient safety and maybe new ways of training and retraining clinical personnel. Now another development that also happened recently uh, and is of course ongoing is the introduction of uh, in, uh, additional knowledge of new procedures in medicine, especially also in surgery. And here you see an image of uh, a prominent example, minimally invasive surgery, where the idea is that you not directly in open surgery work on the surgical site, but via small incisions, for instance, in the skin and using thin endoscopic tools to remotely access the surgical site, which has a lot of advantages for the patient. There's uh, less scarring, less trauma, less pain and faster recovery, but disadvantages for the surgeons. So the surgeon loses hand-eye coordinate coordination. Surgeons have to look at the screen instead of the surgical site. There may even be an assistant required who handles the camera. Um, you can't directly interact with the surgical any site anymore with your tactile sense. So there are uh, a lot of disadvantages and uh, this of course requires specialized training. So in this context, we can maybe look at the options that there are for doing surgical training. And I have another picture here that's a drawing from uh, uh, Eakins already 126 years ago of uh, how the surgical education was taking place. And this paradigm that was used back then is still used nowadays. So the idea is that uh, maybe novices assist in an intervention uh, with an expert surgeon who uh, uh, teaches them um, uh, uh, the knowledge of the surgical intervention. Now this, of course, has to be done. It has to be part of the education, but there are also some concerns. Um, there can be, uh, of course, risks for the patients. And another concern that recently is becoming more important is with regard to working hours. 
there are more and more limitations to working hours of uh, uh, surgeons and there's less time to do actual uh, uh, training like this. What other options are there? You can do training on cadavers, but there you of course have different tissue behavior. Um, uh, you don't have a living organism anymore, there are ethical concerns. Another alternative is for instance training on uh, uh, animals. So it's typical to do training on pigs because incidentally the ana anatomy of pigs is very similar to human anatomy. So you can actually uh, do uh, useful training uh, in such a setting. Of course, there are also organizational and ethical concerns here. You have to anesthetize the peak at the end and special facilities are also required. A further option are these box trainers, which are very simple representations of uh, human anatomy, um, which allow maybe basic training, but uh, of course are not a very uh, realistic representation of, of a living organism. Now, Seeing these options about 15, 20 years ago, when I started in this area, also others thought about it. The idea was, why don't we do something that is also done in flight simulation? Why don't we provide interactive training simulations for medical training? Because there are a lot of advantages. Um, it's risk-free for the patient. It's quantifiable. Um, you can do uh, seldom cases that you don't see very often. You can uh, repeat the cases, which is also difficult in reality. So there are a number of advantages that are, of course, also used very much already in aviation. So we tried to build also such simulators for surgical training. And I want to give you, uh, show you two examples uh, of systems I've built. This was uh, at ETH. Um, and uh, in the context, uh, later I will tell you also some methods that were developed in, uh, in the context of these projects. Uh, the first one on the left is a little bit an older development. Um, I will show you a movie here. This is a, actually a simulated uh, intervention now. This is in the uterine cavity, so in the uterus, in the female organ, uh, inside of the cavity. Um, there can be pathologies, uh, benign growth, like here uh, polyps or um, uh, myomas that have to be cut away. Uh, they can lead to abnormal bleeding or problems uh, with fertility. So they have to be removed electrosurgically. So you will see also here such a tool that is used to remove the tissue. <coughs> um, one more thing, this cavity has to be extended because in the normal state it's collapsed. So there's a fluid used, it's a fluid filled cavity. And due to this extension, the excess is made, but also blood and tissue can be flushed out of the cavity. And I will come to that later because uh, simulating this distension fluid is one important element uh, in, in, the, in this specific simulator. The other example uh, is for arthroscopy. That's a more recent project. That's uh, intervention in the joints. So in the knee joints, in the shoulder joint, in the hip joint, where, for instance, cartilage on the bones has to be shaved off to make it smooth again, or uh, interventions are, for instance, done on the meniscus, and there's a tear in the meniscus to, as you can see here, to make this smooth again, to smooth out this de these defects. Uh, that's a typical intervention in this, in this context. Now, you can already see that these simulators maybe require a number of different methods to compute deformations, to compute fluids, to compute blood flow. And I want to show you on this slide the different elements, the ingredients that are needed to build such a simulator. Um, so these are all algorithms, methods that we develop in our group. Although the first point I want to make here is actually not a uh, technical development, that's the medical expertise. So if you want to have a successful system, you have to start with, uh, in the clinics, you have to analyze the intervention, know, uh, learn about the procedure, how to measure performance and which skills to train. Then the next large group, large component is the training scene. So the, uh, uh, the virtual patients, the virtual, virtual training scene. You can think about it like in a flight simulator where you define maybe different weather conditions, different emergencies like a burning engine, different airports. Uh, we also have to define the training scene. So we have to define the geometry of organs, of pathologies, of instruments. We have to define how they look like visually on the surface, the textures. 
we have to uh, uh, generate vessel systems. So vessels can be the source of bleeding, so we have to know where the vessels are. And we have to acquire tissue parameters, optimally from uh, uh, living tissue, because living tissue uh, shows different behavior than when it's removed from the body. So we developed a number of methods here. I want to give you one example in the context of the hysteroscopy simulator. So for the hysteroscopy, uh, the endoscopic inspection of the uterus, we need a shape with a pre-presentation of the uterus itself, of the organ. So we can get that by acquiring medical data from an MRI scan, segmenting this organ, and then using this triangle mesh, for instance, uh, for the simulation. Now when we do that, we only have one model. So we can train maybe once or twice, but then we know what the model is about, and we haven't represented the variability in the patient population. So that's uh, why we uh, developed methods to actually automatically generate new organ shapes that are within the natural vari variability of the patient population, which can be done with statistical shape models or statistical shape analysis. So the idea is that we actually we start with several of these uh, data sets that were acquired from volunteers. These were segmented into triangle meshes. So here we have these uh, 25 cases that we uh, acquired. Uh, during the segmentation, point correspondences are ensured, which uh, uh, allows us to create a point distribution model where the shape is described by the coordinates of the vertices in the triangle mesh. Now we can do further processing here, carry out uh, a PCA, which uh, uh, gives us a dimensional reduction and allows to uh, move uh, into a shape space where we can describe all these organ shapes with an average shape and combine this with different eye shapes that are appropriately weighted and uh, give us uh, different shapes uh, uh, that are within the natural variability of our data. So by combining this mean shape uh, with these eigenshapes, we can generate new triangle meshes that we then can use for training. So in this short clip here, you see uh, actually uh, for this specific case here, the variation of, uh, of the weight of the second eigenshape, and this gives us uh, a change of the angle between the cervix here and the corpus. So this is not a deformation, these are different organ shapes that we can automatically generate by setting these parameters and uh, combining, uh, using our model by combining here the mean shape with the, uh, the second uh, eigenshape. So with this, we can now already generate new triangle meshes for the simulation that are within, within the natural variation. Um, but there's one more thing that we need, and that is what I already mentioned. We also need deformations. So we are, uh, using a fluid to extend the cavity for the, uh, for the intervention, which is uh, indi uh, uh, indicated here. So this is extended with the fluid. We can compute these deformations, of course, with the deformation model in real time. But uh, I will mention this also later. We have very limited computational budgets. We have to uh, make sure that we have uh, fast update rates and for this reason, we often uh, search for methods to reduce the computation during real time. And this is also something that we did here because the uh, deformations are relatively well behaved. So we decided to pre-compute these in, in an uh, offline uh, finite element computation to determine for this uh, uh, initial organ shape the different deformations that you see indicated here. So they can be more than three, but for these different settings of the fluid, we determine how the, uh, the resulting deformations. And we then use this data and extend our statistical shape model to also now include the deformations in the statistical shape model, which then allows us to not only generate new organ shapes in the undeformed state or in the collapsed state, but we automatically now also get uh, um, the appropriate meshes for the deformations, which we then can use for anim animation and interpolation. And this saves us then computation time during the simulation. <coughs> so this was just one example of what we're doing here in, these, uh, uh, in the training scene generation. Um, what else do we need? We need uh, an, uh, a user interface. So the interface the user, uh, with which the user controls the simulation. 
which typically means we have uh, surgical instruments that are equipped with sensors to give input to the simulation, but at the same time we also want to have feedback from the simulation. Um, visual feedback via the rendering, but also haptic feedback. So Rod already mentioned this, we are interested in touch, touch feedback. So just imagine that you're on the screen, you see that you're interacting with the liver, you're poking the liver, but you also want to feel that you're actually the forces of interacting with the liver. So not only see the deformation. And for this, we need to uh, use these haptic interfaces. That's one larger area of our work, and I will come back to that later. Um, also, other things in the environment are, for instance, audio feedback, depending on user interactions, like the ECG, uh, uh, pumps, uh, air, uh, air uh, supply, etc. Now, then the final element in the simulation is the actual uh, real-time model, the real-time simulation of the patient. We are depending on the input. We have, uh, 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 we have to simulate the behavior at the surgical scene. So uh, we simulate or have to detect collisions between the meshes based on that compute deformations, possibly cut away tissue, uh, simulate bleeding, and potentially also have some physiological models. And I want to give you another example uh, here uh, for the physiological model. Um, again, in the context of the hysteroscopy simulation, and again, uh, related to the distension fluid. <coughs> so I mentioned that we have a fluid inside of this cavity that we use to access the cavity. Uh, a problem appears when we start cutting tissue. So here, this is a tri triangle mesh of a myoma that has to be removed. And inside of this triangle mesh, uh, there are also vessels, vessel systems. And when we cut, so just assuming a cutting plane here, we also cut through the vessels. The problem is that outside here, we have the, this fluid that has, is in a certain, has a certain pressure. And this pressure is typically higher than the blood pressure, so at least for these uh, capillaries here. So that means that the fluid is pressed into the uh, vessel system which can lead to a very serious complication called fluid overload syndrome, which can also lead to death. So uh, um, learning how to handle this is another important aspect of the simulator. And one problem is that you don't see when you cut these vessels because the pressure is too high. And I have a short movie here. Uh, this is from a real intervention. So uh, here the surgeon already removed some tissue electrosurgically and at the start, the uh, pressure setting is at a standard, uh, standard value, and then the, this is reduced, and you will see then how the bleeding starts. So here, this is the beginning, then this, uh, the, it collapses, and you see here at the cut vessels, this is where uh, 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 vessels were cut, and when we don't have enough pressure, then uh, you actually can see the bleeding. So for such a simulation, to do proper training, we also have to include a model for the pressure and the flow conditions in the vessel system. <coughs> so for this, we modeled uh, uh, these, uh, the vessel tree, the vascular system here, as a network of pipes. Um, without going into details with the equations here, uh, we set up some equations to ensure mass conservation. Uh, the flow is computed according to Poisson's law, uh, according to pressure differences and vessel conductance. And vessel conductance depends on the diameter of the vessel here, the length of, uh, of the pipe of the vessel, and uh, the viscosity. So with that, we can already set up a linear system to determine the pressures. But uh, actually, we have to extend this because uh, um, there are some dependencies here. Blood is a non-Newtonian fluid, so the viscosity changes according to the diameters because uh, uh, we have uh, different cells in the blood. So f uh, this is typical for capillaries. So we need an initial equation where the viscosity changes according to the diameter. The other thing to consider here is that also the diameter changes with regard to the pressure. If we have different pressures, the vessels are deformable. So also the diameters will change according to the pressures. So also this has to be included into the model. So that in the end we arrive at such a nonlinear system where we can now uh, numerically uh, 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 obtain a solution based on boundary conditions that are, for instance, defined at the uh, inlet and the outlet uh, of the vessel system. 
And with this model, we actually could reproduce what also is observed in uh, interventions and was also observed uh, in corrosion cast models. So here you see uh, such a, a test scene with a myoma and a number of vessels inside. This is the arterial component, the venous component. These uh, were actually also automatically generated with, with a model. And you will see that there will be cuts appearing into this, uh, into this myoma, just some planes at the different depths. Outside here, we have the um, distension fluid with a constant pressure, 100 millimeters per mercury, mercury. And the pressure inside of the vessel system is encoded uh, with color. And on the right here, for these different cut positions, you can see the different flow conditions at the inlet and the outlet here, depending on the cut. And this is uh, what, the, uh, uh, what we computed with our approach. And this actually uh, reproduces what happens in reality. So uh, we can show that uh, uh, most of the intravasation happens at the venous outlet, so on the venous side. There's no bleeding because the arterial inlet, due to the pressure settings, uh, um, um, there's no large change of the flow. And Deep cuts, which cuts through large vessels, lead to the largest amount of intronization. So having such a model in the simulation now also allows us to train in the simulator for, uh, uh, for, for this aspect. Um, one final uh, example I wanted to make um, is rega regarding tissue deformation. So once more, we have typically very limited uh, computational budgets. Uh, wherefore, we are always searching for ways to speed up our computations. <coughs> and in this case, this was for the arthroscopy simulator. We developed a method, uh, an ad embedded adaptive octree method, where we actually use two meshes. One at the top here is the visualization mesh, which is used for the display on the screen. While at the bottom, these boxes here, these are hexahedral element and in, in a co-rotational final element method, these are used for computing the deformation. And uh, uh, of course, this has a lower resolution, and the deformations we compute here are then projected onto the visualization mesh. And uh, let me show you this with an, uh, another example movie. So here, this is a deformable surface, a user is interacting with it, and you see now overlaid this adaptive octree mesh, which is uh, uh, refined or uh, also coarsened again depending on deformation energies. So that means that we look uh, where deformation happens and focus the computation in these areas by subdividing the mesh, while in other areas where we don't need a lot of computation because there's not a lot of deformation happening, we can uh, save computation time. <coughs> okay, so these uh, were just some examples of methods that we have to develop to build such a surgical simulator. Um, there's one last point I want to make is um, that uh, not only uh, this is developed in the academic context, but we are also inter interested in technology, technology transfer. So we have an interest that these systems are actually used for surgical training. And we also could do this, as uh, Ruth already mentioned, uh, via a startup that we created and which now builds these sim simulators that use part of our methods, and these are now used worldwide for uh, surgical education. But let me get now back to the second part where I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, the research that we're, that we're doing also now here in Innsbruck. And uh, you already have seen that we have a number of different activities. Um, I try to categorize them here into three large areas, human-computer interaction, or short interaction, computer graphics, short graphics, or physically-based simulation. Simulation. So this is, for instance, also why we called us IGS, Interactive Graphics and Simulation, uh, because that's what we're doing. We're also doing haptics. So last year, uh, when I thought about a name for the group, I also thought about something like this, Interaction Simulation Computer Haptics and Graphics Lab, which is, of course, way too long. And the acronym is actually ISCHGL, which I think is known in a different context. So we stayed with the uh, IGS, <coughs> and I want to give you three examples of work that we're currently doing regarding deformation simulation, uh, computer haptics, and augmented reality. Uh, deformation simulation, so here we always have a trade-off. 
between the computation time and the accuracy. And we have the problem that we always have to be in real time. Now, uh, another short movie, this is again a real intervention during arthroscopy where a surgeon probes uh, the meniscus and you see here some very characteristic folds appearing that the surgeon also wants to see or expects to see. Now to simulate that, we either need high resolution meshes or uh, we need nonlinear material models, which in the end also leads to very expensive numerical solvers. <coughs> The problem is that we again have these hard real-time requirements. We need update rates for the visual feedback for the rendering of 60 to 120 hertz, depending on the number of buffers that we're using and also if it's stereo or uh, mono, monoscopic rendering. So simulating what you have just seen with such high resolution messes is out of the question, unless maybe we use a parallel cluster. So we often use, uh, try to find approaches to uh, um, make these simulations faster, or these deformation computations. And one approach I want to mention here is that, uh, uh, we, tried, uh, that we tried is to decompose simulations into a coarse uh, part and into a detail part. And the details are pre-computed and then added later on to the coarse simulation. So let me give you a quick overview of how this looks like. We call this a data-driven deformation model because in the sense we try to obtain before the simulation uh, a lot of data that we use during the interaction or during the runtime, during the real-time simulation. The first phase is the pre-computation phase where here we run two simulation models, a coarse simulation model that gives us also uh, only a coarse deformation without these details, but it runs fast and an accurate simulation uh, that can run on the order of minutes or even longer. But this simulation also has these details that we want to have. So we determine the difference between the two, we store the differences as so-called stamps, and we also store for the course simulation uh, the interaction state. So where we are in contact, how local displacements are, um, and store this in the database, uh, of course, for a number of different uh, interactions. Then the idea is that uh, during runtime phase, when the user interacts, this time again with the course simulation, we look at the context state here, at the displacements, we do a, carry out a correlation with our stored data and find all matching stamps or similar stamps for this specific uh, deformation condition and uh, uh, sum them together, appropriately weighted, and add this to the course simulation to have an enriched object with details. So again, to give you uh, a short uh, movie, how this looks like, this is an example. It's not an organ, it's another important element. It's a, a pillow. And uh, this pillow, again, also uses an embedding approach. The pillow here, this red object, is, uh, um, is a visualization surface mesh. And these uh, wireframe cubes here, this is a deformation model, which you can see is uh, very low resolution. So the resulting deformations will also not be highly detailed. So when you see the interaction here, there is some deformation appearing. Um, but this deformation is, of course, not very detailed due to the low coarse resolution mesh. Now we have pre-computed details, folds that we obtained. And now you see the same example, only now this is the same resolution, only now we add the details to the simulation. So all these folds that are appearing here have been pre-computed and are added to the simulation. In this case, actually, it has been acquired, it has not been computed, but uh, acquired with a sensor from a real pillow during interaction. But the idea is the same, that we first acquire data and then add it during the runtime to enhance the simulation. Uh, we are currently trying to extend this by uh, looking at multiple contact points. Uh, this is only quasi-static so far, so we also want to look into dynamic models see how we can handle cutting, topology changes, and also how we can transfer details from one region that is similar to the other one to reduce the amount of data that we have to acquire at the start. Um, another example, computer haptics. Um, maybe not many of you know this yet, so computer haptics is about the sense of touch, creating touch feedback according to user interaction, which can be done, for instance, with devices like this, a haptic device, that is uh, equipped with a number of actuators 
and depending on the user interaction, forces are uh, generated and sent to the user. It can be forces like this, but haptics also com uh, comprises the tactile feedback, so feedback to the uh, skin of the user. Now we also want to generate these in the simulations. Uh, problems are that the mechanoreceptors in the skin have a very high temporal and spatial resolution, while the material is also rather complex. So we again have to find a way to do this uh, fast. And especially in this case, we have to be in order of magnitude faster, about one kilohertz, due to the resolution of the mechanoreceptors. So here we also try a similar approach. We first uh, do some prior uh, processing and then use this during the real-time interaction. Um, so this we call data-driven haptic rendering. The idea is we acquire with some sensors, with force sensors, acceleration sensors, during an interaction, data such as forces, etc. Do this for a number of different uh, pokes, interactions with the objects, uh, which gives us a large data set, which we somehow have to process, reduction, machine learning, etc., which then gives us a representation that allows us to synthesize new forces based on new interactions just by uh, uh, using this data without an underlying deformation model. <coughs> um, so far, we have mainly looked at single contact uh, locations. Uh, now, here in Innsbruck, we are trying to extend this to uh, two contact points. So, in the sense of grasping an object, squeezing it, and maybe lifting it. This is the work I'm doing with my PhD student Anatoly here. And uh, we have set up uh, an acquisition setup, like you can see up here, similar to material science that we use to uh, actually interact with the object and acquire interaction data. So you will see down here two movies that uh, for this uh, sampling that you will see up here show the recorded forces. We will also introduce a phase difference here between these two contact points. First they are in phase, so we have a, a zero phase, and then uh, we change this, you will see this here, and this is also plotted up here looking at displacements of the contact points in one dimension. <coughs> so. This is an automatic approach. We sample a number of different objects uh, at different contact points, at different amplitudes, at different frequencies, and also a number of different uh, of these test samples. And uh, based on that, our idea is to, to build a, a kind of a dictionary a material database that we then later can use to, uh, to do rendering of uh, new materials that we see. So what we have to do here is uh, we have to do some data reduction. Um, this is one example curve of one interaction at one contact point, the displacement versus the force. You see that there's non-linearities in hysteresis. And uh, looking at these individual peaks here, these, is, these are for different phase settings. For instance, the first one is a zero phase. The idea now, inspired by Fourier transform rheology, is to transform this into, uh, uh, into the spectral domain. So here you see uh, uh, harmonics. The first harmonic here is at 2 hertz. That is also the sampling frequency that we used. But there are also further harmonics. And here we now sample at the highest amplitudes, um, which is also related to the viscoelastic moduli, to the storage and the loss moduli. And at these positions, uh, we can now plot these harmonics. This is the first harmonic where we plot the uh, uh, storage moduli G prime and the loss moduli uh, G double prime with respect to each other. And one of these curves here is one point in this, uh, in this graph. Of course, we have uh, several interactions. We have, uh, uh, first of all, uh, we have changed the phase in certain steps. We uh, changed the amplitude in three steps from small, medium to large amplitudes and also three steps for the uh, uh, acquisition frequencies. So in the end, we have here uh, uh, um, more than 100 samples. In the first harmonic, of course, we have further harmonics. Uh, this one mainly represents the linear component of, this, uh, of the material, while the further harmonics uh, represent uh, nonlinear components. Typically, we go here up to the fifth harmonic in our current work. Now this is only for uh, one material, so testing one of these blocks at one contact location. We of course want to do this with several materials to have a very large representation of, uh, of this material space. 
So we also do this for other samples. Here you just see some example curves again of the displacement uh, force relationship. And here with the similar analysis for nine materials now, the extended first to third harmonic. <coughs> now this data we take and try to reduce further. So uh, first we do an, uh, a representation with spectral RBF and then we resample the spectral RBF representation uh, along all the dimensions, which gives us uh, 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 finer representations of our data. You again see here the first to the third harmonic. Uh, we have a third dimension here added now also the phase uh, in our model. There are further dimensions that are not shown. These are just uh, projections. And to process this further, now we do something similar to an inverse uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and inverse strategy where we kind of uh, try to select only the kernels, the spectral kernels that have uh, uh, large information to describe our material behavior. So we further reduce our data, which in the end gives us a reduction of two orders of magnitude from the initial data. We then project back from the frequency space into the time domain, and with this model, if we have a new sample, we can find an optimal representation and use this then for the uh, haptic rendering. So this is ongoing work. Uh, we hope to publish this uh, soon in one uh, of the IEEE journals. Now, my time is running out. Uh, just one last example regarding augmented reality. Um, I think maybe you have heard about augmented reality uh, before uh, in the context of Google Glass or Microsoft HoloLens or uh, Oculus Rift. The idea is basically that the user maybe wears a head-mounted display with some cameras. This, by the way, is a prototype for research, so it's not ergonomically designed. <coughs> um, we capture the real environment with camera, with the cameras, which goes to a PC where we can do some overlay with uh, uh, simulated information, and this then combined is displayed to the user. So we can, for instance, overlay these virtual blocks onto the video stream. Now, in our context, we also want to use this technique for surgical training, and we want to make augmented reality interactive. So that uh, means that we want to interact with the augmentation, which uh, uh, gives us additional requirements regarding perception. So for instance, if we just draw these virtual objects on top of the video stream, we, don't, uh, we are not concerned, or we don't take care of, uh, of depth information and, and occlusions. And for real, uh, realistic interaction, we should also do that. And I have a short movie here, which tries to illustrate that. So this is, we have two images for the left and the right eye in the head mount display. And we now want to determine in real time the occlusions between the real objects and the virtual objects and vice versa. So we use a plane sweep approach here that is uh, uh, implemented on the GPU to have it in real time. And this then allows to determine uh, uh, which objects occlude each other, and by calibrating, for instance, also the light sources and knowing uh, the viewing position and the depths, we can, for instance, also create shared shadows. So shadows from the real environment on the virtual objects or shadows from the virtual objects onto the real environment, which gives additional information about the depths of objects. <coughs> now, <coughs> Why we're doing this again, we want to use this technology again in the context of surgical simulation. And we want to move actually from mini million invasive interventions to open surgery. And this is just one first prototype how this could look like. Uh, we have a plastic leg here that uh, um, has a hole inside. And inside this hole, we now add with augmented reality some tissue, some virtual tissue. Uh, which the user can uh, interact with, with surgical tools that are connected to haptic interfaces so that the user gets also touch feedback from this virtual tissue, but at the same time also uh, uh, from, from the real environment. And we hope this is still a very rough prototype. It's not yet ready for training, of course, but uh, we hope that in the future we can use this technology also for surgical training. Okay, um, I'm nearing the end. One more important thing I want to do is to acknowledge everybody who worked on this, because without a great team behind uh, yourself, it's not possible to achieve all this. So you see up here um, my current team here in Innsbruck, 
And uh, the other two rows are from ETH, the PhD student, yeah, uh, encoded in green, uh, postdocs, and also software engineers who helped with these developments. And to close, maybe thinking about generations of surgical simulation, um, this is the first one I built at ETH more than 15 years ago, which uh, if you compare it to flight simulation, is maybe similar to the third, first uh, uh, flight training systems for pilots 100 years ago. Now we are maybe at this stage, so uh, this is a so-called link simulator, the link trainer that was used in the Second World War to train pilots in, uh, in instrument flying. And what we want to get at is of course such a simulator, uh, highly realistic on a motion platform, and to get there, that's what we're doing here in Innsbruck, next door in the ICT building, and maybe in 10 years you will see something like this. So uh, the future of medical education is no longer blood and guts, it's bits and bytes. And uh, to reveal also this, this is actually the title of another paper in 2000 by a, actually a group of surgeons at Stanford University. Uh, Tom Crummel is the chair of the Department of Surgery and also the, from the side, from the surgical side, there's a clear interest to use these simulators for education in medicine. And with that, I want to close. I think outside there's uh, food and drinks for you, so uh, you are uh, warmly invited to stay and maybe also ask questions. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.